Uh, we're here today to interview uh, Sid Savage, a World War II veteran. Sid was born in Butler, Pennsylvania, December 28, 1918. Uh, he enlisted in the Army February the 4th, 1941, and was honorably discharged October the 4th, 1945. During Sid's time in service, he served in the uh, South Pacific with the 145th Division, uh, 145th Infantry of the 37th Division. Sid was uh, with the medical detachment of the 145th Infantry, served as a company aid man or a medic. He rose to the rank of uh, surgical technician fifth grade, which was equivalent to the rank of corporal. Sid saw service during the invasions of Guadalcanal, New Georgia, uh, uh, Rendova, Bougainville, Vela, Lavella, and Luzon. And as a result of Sid's service, he was awarded two Bronze Stars, the American Defense Ribbon, the Asiatic Pacific Campaign Ribbon with two Bronze Stars, World War II Victory Medal, a Good Conduct Ribbon, and the Combat Medic Badge. So, uh, Sid, uh, we're glad to have you here this morning and anxious to hear some of your stories, but before we do that, uh, you were born in uh, Butler, Pennsylvania in uh, 1918, so uh, to start the interview, could you go back and uh, maybe tell us what you remember about growing up in Butler, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania? Your, something about your family, your background, neighborhood, and things of that nature? Uh, I, I was born in uh, Butler, Pennsylvania on December 28, 1918, as you said, and uh, I was there through... I started grade school at West End. We lived on Fifth Avenue, and the school was up on the corner. And uh, we lived at 219 Fifth Avenue. I still remember that. And uh, we had a lot of family around us. My parents are both immigrants. Uh, My mother came from a town in Poland called Bialystok, which was on a borderline where half the time it belonged to Russia and half the time it belonged to Poland. My dad uh, came f- was born in Lithuania, which was part of the Soviet Union. And uh, when they came to America, my dad came to Pittsburgh uh, w- with a brother of his and uh, back in the early 1900s. My mother came over to the United States with her brother. And uh, they wound up in Butler, Pennsylvania, joining other members of the family. And just to give you a little history about that, uh, I'm of Jewish faith. And uh, when my parents came over, they came over to avoid uh, persecution in Europe. And... uh, It was interesting that uh, the way they did things, when my father came over with his brother, they both worked, and then they brought over another brother. And the three of them worked, and they brought over their mother and sister. And that's the way it was done. And my mother, when she came over with her brother, uh, they both worked, and then they brought over a sister's family. Uh, So until everybody was kind of organized. And uh, I went to, started grade school there. And when I was about six years old, I think in that area, had just started. uh, My dad decided to uh, move to Akron because that's where he had his brother. He had actually three brothers, a sister and his mother. He wanted to be closer to his family. So we moved to Akron, and uh, I grew up in Akron, went to grade school, Krauss School, Red School on the Hill Diagonal Road, and I also went to, graduated from West High School, and uh, I started work when I was 11 years old. Uh, I had a paper route. We sold magazines door-to-door, Collier's, Saturday Evening Post, 
My brother was four years my senior, and uh, he became a manager for the Akron Times Press. So he delivered the Times Press newspapers. Now, and let me interrupt here. The, the money that you made doing those jobs, was that your money to keep, or did that go into the family income to help? Uh, actually, uh, that was my money to keep. Uh, we, I never knew that we were poor. Uh, my mother made food spread out. You know, we ate a lot of potatoes and a lot of bread and butter. Uh, so I was never aware that we were poor. But I, in reality, we were. I know that my parents had struggled. So uh, I, I was able to save my money. But you don't save that much money back then. We might have made a, a dollar or two a week from the newspapers. And then when I was about uh, 15 years old, I got a job, an extra job on a Saturday at the Quaker Market, which was a produce and meat market right next door to Quaker Oats Company. And I don't mind telling you, I tell my children this story. I had a report for work at 6 o'clock in the morning. And we would go down to the cooler and bring up the fruit and set it up. I worked on the fruit produce side. And I had to work until 10 o'clock at night. From 6 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, a half hour for lunch, a half hour for dinner. We had to mop the floor before we left. In those days, they had watercolor on the windows. We had to wash the windows. We had to pass inspection. And for all of that, my pay was a dollar and a half. And I used to spend seven cents for the bus fare to go home. And I remember going home on an empty bus. And the bus driver knew me from every Saturday night. And he said, kid, why don't you sit down? I said, if I sit down, I won't get up. So uh, that was the old. And I remember uh, during the Depression, and those were Depression years, and in the 30s, early 30s, and I remember seeing people, men in front of the Quaker Oats Company, selling apples, and uh, that, which was part of the Depression. And I remember when the NRA came in, when President Roosevelt introduced the NRA and made the minimum wage 45 cents an hour. When people today want twenty dollars an hour, uh, forty-five cents an hour netted fourteen dollars and forty cents per week for a forty-hour week, and that's the way things were. And half the country got a raise at the at the forty-five cent level. And um, when I graduated high school, I wanted to go to college, and then well, there was the war had started in Europe, and I didn't know what the situation would be, but the, you had to sign up for the draft uh, in October of 1940, and you had to be 21 years old to sign up for the draft. And incidentally, my brother, God rest his soul, he and I were listening to the radio. There was no TV in those days when they were drawing the numbers out of the bowl for the draft. And uh, we had twin beds. We slept in the same bedroom. And we were listening to the radio, and I heard the announcers say, one, four, four, zero. And I looked at my brother, and I said, that's my number. So... How did, how did, how did you feel about, about that? Well, I... Uh, I really don't know how I felt. I, I, it was kind of a big deal to hear your name come out of the bowl because I didn't know what to expect. But then I began to realize that I had to go into the service for a year, and I didn't. And I wanted to go to school, so I went down to enlist about maybe within a month after that, and they wouldn't let me enlist. Uh, the fellow looked at me and he said, well, we're not going to take you. He said, what's your name? And you look up your number. And I said, well, why not? He said, you are order number six for the city of Akron. So all we have to do is take six people and you're going. 
And um, I said, well, I'd still like to enlist. He said, no, no. He said, you're going to be leaving in December anyway. Well, later in November, they advised me that they weren't ready in December. That way they were delaying it, that we would go in January. So I went down a second time to try to enlist. I don't know whether I was being patriotic or just wanted to get my year over with. And uh, before January and December, they notified us that they weren't ready yet. So again, I went down to enlist. I said, well, let me get in the service and then I can pick my service. I said, I may want to go in the Navy. I may want to go in the Air Force. Uh, I'm, I'd rather have a choice. And he said, no, you get, everything is so new that you'll get to do whatever you want. And I said, fine. And then they notified me to report February 4th, 1941. And I, Let me go back and ask you a question here. You talked about uh, the war in Europe starting in the uh, late 30s there. Uh, what kind of news coverage uh, do you remember... Uh, taking place in America about the war in Europe in the 30s. Uh, you mentioned you, you were uh, a well, Jewish background. Did that have any kind of a effect on you? To it, see it, uh, it did. It did have an effect. And uh, I remember reading about Hitler. And uh, we knew nothing about the concentration camps in those days, uh, which is rather interesting it was like a deep, dark secret. But I knew that he was going from country to country, taking each country over. We were aware of what was happening to England. And uh, the British really stood up. Uh, how they took what they did, I don't know, but they did. And as I learned later in my own experience, you never know what you can do until you have to. And... Uh, so, uh, February 4th, I did finally get into the service. Or did, the, did the movie theaters and the newspapers give the war in Europe uh, any kind of coverage at all? Uh, uh, the 30s there? Somewhat, but not a lot. Okay. They were not getting a lot of coverage. And we really didn't know what was happening uh, to the Jews at that time. And uh, it's rather, uh, as a side note, when my mother and brother came over here, and her, bro- and her brother, uh, they had another brother that they wanted to bring over. And he said, why shall I go to America when I have it good here? And he owned, we learned later, that he owned a foundry, uh, probably like Belden Brick to a degree, not as big, I'm sure, and a tannery. But By their standards, he was wealthy, and uh, they stayed in Europe, never came over. And the end result was that my mother's family went up in those furnaces from uh, Bergen-Belsen. And there was uh, one nephew, Uh, this particular uncle, said that there was, this is a story that came from a son, uh, that there was one of the guards at Bergen Belsen that was a little friendlier than others. And uh, my uncle, whom I never met, never knew actually ex- other than by name, uh, went to this guard and said that if he would allow one child to escape to say the memorial prayer, for, which is a Jewish custom when they say the memorial prayer for the dead, to let one child escape, that he would see to it that he were rewarded with jewels. And the guard said that he would think about it. And he came back and he decided to do it. So he let this one young man go. And uh, it was interesting that he, he went out, he was allowed to escape, and I'm going to tell you how he did that. And then he fought with the French freedom fighters till the end of the war. And at the end of the war, he was a man without a country. And my uncle in Butler, Pennsylvania, my mother's brother, 
received a phone call from a agency in New York that they found this young man, uh, and I think he at the time he was in Israel or France, I'm not sure, and that uh, <clears throat> he had relatives in Butler, Pennsylvania, and he was trying to locate them. And they checked him out, and sure enough, uh, it was verified that he was the son of uh, my mother's brother. And uh, they, we tried to bring him to America, and we could not bring him to America. And uh, my first wife uh, had a cousin that was a Canadian, and he was an attorney in Canada. And we went up to visit him one day, and we were telling him our dilemma. And he says, well, I know someone in Canada who specializes in immigration law. And we contacted him, and he said, well, he'll see what he could do. So he found a farmer that would sign a paper that uh, this young man would not be, he would not be responsible for him if he brought him over. Uh, So my mother was the one that went to Canada and uh, met the farmer and she, uh, and of course it all can be told now, she paid the attorney for his work, paid the farmer for signing a paper for having him come over and then signed another paper for the farmer releasing that the farmer would not be responsible for him. And uh, he's the one that told my mother about how his father bribed the guard and that he was put into a garbage truck. And when the garbage truck left the concentration camp, he was, he was on it. So evidently the guard teamed up with a couple of other people and uh, that's the way he got out. And then he had met a young woman in, in Bergen-Belsen uh, whose husband was killed, but she wasn't. And he wanted to know if he could marry her and bring her over. And my mother told him that he could. And uh, she was the first one to go to Canada. When she came back, she looked at me. She said, he's the same size as you are. I want you to go through your closet and you take something of everything from socks to underwear, shirts, ties, whatever, and send it to him. And she looked at my wife and she said, his wife is the same size you are. I want you to go through your closet and send her something of everything, panties, bras, clothes, whatever, everything. And we did. And when uh, my wife and I first went up and met him, and I remember we took he and his wife out to dinner at a very fine restaurant. And in the middle of the dinner, his wife began to cry. They laid out silverware in China. And she said she hadn't seen that since she was a child. And we tried to give him money, and he would not take money. He, took the, he accepted the clothes, but would not take money. And uh, in fact, when we left to come home, he, he brought a package for me, a bottle of Crown Royal for, for me, and I don't drink, and a bottle of Crown Royal for my brother, who did not drink, but we accepted it graciously. But it was interesting, he would never take money. And uh, we, he had one son, who today is a, a, a psychiatrist, psychology. And uh, it's interesting that among the refugees, their kids that go to medical school become psychiatrists or psychologists in that deal. And um, that was after, and then I would get into the, as I got older, and I, when I went to the service. Yeah, that's the next thing I wanted to lead into. Uh, you finally... I finally got into the service. February 4th, 1941. February 4th, 1941. We got on the train in Akron. And uh, I remember they locked the doors. Why they locked the doors, I don't know, because I don't think we could jump anyway. But they locked the doors, and they took us to Cleveland. 
And in Cleveland, they unlocked the doors, and we we got off the train. We went into the armory, and we were sworn in to the army. Uh, put us back on the train, locked the doors, and we went to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. And uh, has this been the first time that you've been away from home? I had never been out of the state of Ohio or Pennsylvania prior to that. Uh, I felt like I was being, becoming a man of the world, seeing the country, because we kept looking out the train as we went south. We went through all the different states and everything. And uh, Cam Shelby, uh, we were taken off the train, and we were from Akron, so we were assigned to K Company, 145th Infantry of the 37th Division, which incidentally was a National Guard unit uh, that was uh, federalized at that time. So even though we weren't from the, we were not National Guard, uh, we became the replacements to become up to company strength. Now it was still peacetime. Now we were, they taught, we were lived in tent, tent city. There were no barracks. And uh, we were getting training. We were learning how to march and all that sort of thing. And we were given rifles and taught how to handle a rifle and packs and walking. Did a lot of walking. And uh, and then uh, we went on maneuvers, which was the largest maneuver in the country at that particular time. And that was... Towards the middle or the end, I would say it was around the fall, and the maneuvers were the Louisiana maneuvers that were run by Colonel Eisenhower, who later became General Eisenhower. And uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, They'd march us across a river where we were in water up to our neck, and then we'd get to the other side, and they'd say, this is where we're going to stay tonight. Uh, They were breaking us in. And then uh, we experienced December 7th. Was, go ahead, was, I was going to ask you, uh, you know, while you were in the service there uh, leading up to December 7th, uh, did you, was there any indications uh, from conversations, newspapers, uh, movies about any problems developing with Japan prior to December the 7th? Uh, no. Okay. We never heard anything about problems with Japan we had an inkling, well, we knew that, that, that England was having the problems in the European war. And we also felt that we were helping England uh, behind the scenes, where we were sending them supplies and everything, even though we weren't sure of what was happening. And uh, on this, and we did, were, had no idea whatsoever about Japan. And yet I understand... Uh, well, after after Pearl Harbor, when we read the paper, I think there was a Japanese envoy who was in the White House talking to Roosevelt about peace with Japan as Pearl Harbor was being bombed. And uh, I was another fellow from Company K, and I were visiting a third friend from Akron at Jackson Air Base in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, we went in on a Saturday and we were stayed overnight. We were coming back on Sunday. And Sunday morning, we were going out for breakfast. And the fellow from the air base went in to see if the restaurant was open. And he came out with a face of gloom on his face. And he came by and he said, they're bombing Pearl Harbor. And I'm not sure we, that we even knew where Pearl Harbor was at that time. So we turned the radio on in the car, and there was a tape, continuous. All coastal troops report back to your base immediately. All coastal troops report back to your base immediately. So we took uh, Rosie back to the base, and we went back to Shelby. And when we got back there, the company, they were already packing up to go out, and we... uh, we went to, I was with the unit, uh, 
that went to Pascagoula, Mississippi, where we took over Ingalls shipbuilding yards and the public utilities. And we had a weapons carrier, which is like a pickup truck, with a 50 caliber machine gun going up and down the Gulf of Mexico, waiting for them to come in because nobody knew what was happening. And then we had a detail that was cutting down palm trees and putting a snub nose on them and put them on horses so that from the ocean it looked like uh, big naval guns. But nothing happened. So they, there, the fear of invasion. It was a fear of invasion. It was not only on the West Coast, but... Where That's we right, about. where we were. Uh, it, do you remember listening to uh, Roosevelt's uh, speech declaring war upon Japan? Did you hear that? Uh, I think, well, I, I do, I do remember. This was a day of infamy. Right. We remember Roosevelt very well. What were your feelings about that, knowing... Well, we... At this point, you're 20, At this point, you're about 23. I'm about 22. 22. I'm 22. And uh, now the patriotism began to sink in. And uh, I think I mentioned to you that at, at that stage of my life, I didn't know my own strength. And, the, and I really wanted to get into it. I wanted to get over there. Uh, number one, being an American. And number two, knowing what was happening to uh, some of the Jewish people by that time that we really wanted to get into it. Well, what happens now uh, while you're down in, uh, in Mississippi here? What takes place there and where, where do you go? From in Mississippi, uh, at Pascagoula, we were, we were at the English shipbuilding yards. And during the Gulf War, or just the, I think before Iraq, where the destroyer that was hit, they brought it back for repair to English shipbuilding yards in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi. So I remember them. And I do remember that they wondered, uh, I was a loner. I uh, didn't do much social life in the service. And, uh, but that was, you had to spend Christmas day with a, with a family. Every, everybody, we took turns. Some people, some soldiers had lunch with a family. Some had dinner with a family. You had people on guard and those that went. And I remember that I was sent to uh, a family called Mr. Roger Boy, who was a manufacturer of corrugated cartons. I remember that. Very, very fine people, lovely people. And his neighbor was the editor of the New York, or the New Orleans Times Picune. And after dinner, he came over. And we really had some interesting discussions on uh, world events, what's happening in the world. And uh, we figured it was just a question of time of when we would get into it. And after we were taken back to Camp Shelby and uh, we were moved to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. And we were supposed to sail on the Normandy on February 14th, our advance We had two advanced details. One was sent to North Africa, which is the one I think we were going to follow. And another one was sent to Caraco, Venezuela. Why they sent them there, I don't know. But we were told that we were going to sail on the French ship Normandy, which was the fastest ship afloat at that time, and that we were going over without escort. And I don't mind telling you, I was... I don't know about the other fellas, but I was really concerned because if we're going over without escort, those submarines would really be laying for this big target. And the the sailing date was set as February 14. On February 9th, the ship rolled over on its side. It was sabotaged. And I think about a week or two later, we were shipped cross-country to San Francisco. Now, at this point, point in your military are you classified as a medic I was classified as a medic I was attached to uh, uh, I left that part out but I'm going to go back to it when I was in company K originally which was the Akron unit 
I think we were there a couple of weeks and they we fell out on a Saturday morning and they were going through the roster and a group of men were going to the MPs and a group of men were going to the engineers and a group of men were going to field artillery from behind and a group of men were going to the medics. And I was one, they were all, all the R's and S's went to the medics. And being an S savage, <clears throat> and I thought I was going to a base hospital. And I remember the fellow that I went to Jackson, Mississippi with, who incidentally, we grew up together in Akron. We were real close buddies uh, th- through grade school and high school. And I said, well, I'll, I'll get in touch with you and all. And then the uh, sergeant said, uh, Okay, everybody going to the medics, just take your bunk, you're going up, you're just going up the street to the first battalion. And they read off the names and Savage, you're going to, you're going to be a company aid man for company B, first battalion, attached to them. And, uh, and then we started getting medical training when the other people would be out in the field. Uh, we would go in the field, we'd come in from the field, and then we had to go to the uh, battalion aid station where the medical officers would teach us first aid, what to do for certain types of wounds. And they kept drilling us and telling us uh, to make sure that everybody was aware that if you get shot, it's not like the movies, the cowboy movies, where you're on a horse, you get shot and you fall over dead. Or you're, they have in a duel and you get shot and you fall over dead. That you get shot and you live. That you're, you, more people live than die. And that was drilled into us because of going into shock and everything. Now these uh, doctors uh, who were responsible for your training, have they seen any? They, uh, at that point, none of them have seen the combat. Uh, but we had wonderful doctors. Uh, we had doctors from uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, uh, uni- and from the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And we had a couple of ho- doctors there originally from uh, Cleveland Clinic. There was a Dr. Biola and a Dr. Uh, uh, Philizantia. And I remember he had a very heavy brogue and he used to try to teach us the the aspirin is antipyretic, uh, anti-fire for fever and antalgesic, goes against the nerve endings for pain. And that was the overall pill for the army. But we were taught to use uh, sulfonilamide in wounds and uh, pressure bandages and how to uh, strap them up for fractures and all. So now that uh, you've had this training, and you're headed west now, do uh, you have any idea where you're going? Uh... Uh, we didn't know where we were going other than that we were going to San Francisco. And uh, then when we, uh, when we got aboard ship in San Francisco, uh, we were told that we were heading for the Fiji Islands, that the Japanese were on Guadalcanal, and that Fiji Islands was going to be the first line of defense. And uh, that we were heading for the big island in Fiji, the Vini Levu, at Suva. But there were, Fiji had a small harbor, and they didn't want to put all the ships in the same harbor at one time. So there were a few of the ships that were side-tracked and were sent to New Zealand. And I was on one of those ships. So I was in New Zealand for a month prior to going to Fiji. And we lived uh, in a little town called Manurewa where we watched these big sheep herds and we watched them shear the sheep. And the dogs would run around and I learned that the sheep had big bodies on them, but spindly legs. And they were so heavily laden with wool that if they fell on their back, they couldn't roll over. They would just lay there, and the dogs would go get somebody to get somebody to roll them over. 
But I want to give you one side note of when I was in uh, San Francisco. Uh, I had never flagged a ride in my life. And uh, one of my buddies who was the other aid man, Link Schaffman, God rest his soul, uh, he was a school teacher and uh, he also had a degree in accounting. So he worked at a bank and he was a school teacher. And he said, let's flag a ride into town. And I said, Link, I've never flagged a ride in my life. I said, why don't we take a cab or a bus or something? No, 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 no. Let's, let's flag a ride. Well, we get down on the main street. And uh, a car stops to pick us up. And there's a very well-dressed woman driver. She's all alone. Evening gown. And as we're heading in, she said, are you soldier boys? And we said, well, we're just going in for dinner. She says, if you don't mind, she said, my mother just loves soldier boys. Would you mind going home with me? Well, before I could answer, he said, of course. So we wound up going on Knob Hill. And uh, we get into this home where the door was this wide and then it opened up like that. And we were in the home of Mrs. Hale of the Hale Brothers Department Stores in San Francisco. And uh, Mrs. Hale, senior Mrs. Hale, and incidentally, the woman that picked us up, her husband was a professor at one of the universities. And she begins telling us how badly she feels that she can't take us. They were heading, there was, Eddie Canner was doing a benefit for the war that night, and they had tickets but they didn't have, but she said, you have to come back for dinner. And we said, well, we don't know. We're getting ready. She said, well, you don't worry about it. I'll take care of that. And I don't know how she did or who she talked to. But uh, we get a message that uh, we're going to be picked up on whatever night it was. And here comes this limousine driven car. And I remember I got up front with the driver and there was a glass between us. And Link Schaffman was in the back. And we went up there, and she was telling us about her son, who developed who a a ship, a boat that will only take six feet of water. She said it's not in production, but you will hear about it later in the war. And that the secretary of the Navy Stimson, he couldn't, I think he couldn't get past him, but he got to Roosevelt, and uh, they were making it. And then later in the war, we learned. When we were on the LSTs and the LCIs that only took six feet of water, that was her son that did that. And we corresponded with her for a long time. And then somehow it just dropped out. Now we get back to the war. That's a side deal. That was kind of an interesting story in contrast to where you're you're headed. For where we headed. You were involved in uh, five invasions, uh, different invasions. South right. Uh, was Guadalcanal your first? Well, when we were on Fiji, uh, that was the first line of defense. So we set up a, a defense line, and we would send patrols out to live with the natives, to befriend the natives, in case we had to pull back. And we used to carry hard candy for the kids and cigarettes for the grown-ups. And we actually lived in grass huts, those of us that were on the patrols. And every time a patrol went, a medic had to go. So I would go on one, Schaffman would go on one. We would take turns. And a lot of times he was married. And when we'd go on patrols, I'd volunteer to go in his place. Uh, Because I figured I'm single and if anything happened to me, you know, I've gotten it. But he, he had a wife back home. What kind of thoughts and feelings do you have going on well, with those patrols? Uh, at that point, it was, it was uh, an interesting experience because nobody was shooting at us. But then we were told we were going to Guadalcanal. And uh, actually, uh, the Marines had made the initial landing on Guadalcanal. And we were to relieve the, the Marines. And uh, at that, at, up to that point, we had already been practicing climbing over the ship on, on a net, coming up and down on a net. 
And they would take a platoon at a time aboard ship, and would stay there for a couple of days, coming up and down and everything. But every time a platoon went, a medic had to go. So I think I spent like three months on, or a month or so on that, going up back and forth on that ship up and down that net. And when we got to Guadalcanal, we did climb over the nets and we went in on the Higgins boats. And we hit the beach. We relieved them. I remember a P-38. Uh, there was an air battle going on while we were landing. And this P-38 was shot down. And it crashed pretty close to one of our ships. And later, uh, we went through the American cemetery there. And we saw the propeller of the pilot of that particular plane where somebody had scratched in the date, which was the date that we landed. And I don't remember what that date was. But then we sent, we had patrols going out and we, we did mop up. And the, uh, the worst thing that we had on Guadalcanal, the Marines had the worst of it. The people that we relieved. Because we were getting off the ship and they were getting on the ship. Uh, we got off the Higgins boat and hit the beach and they got on the Higgins boats going to the ship. Uh, but we were, our mission was to guard Henderson Airfield. And uh, we had air raids every night, every night and every night. We'd, we'd hear those bombs coming down when they'd roar. And uh, at one point, we were told that uh, if we hear airplanes in the air tonight, not to become alarmed because we have a surprise for the Japanese. And Guadalcanal was over here, and right across the bay was Tulagi. And on Tulagi was where all the anti-aircraft guns were. So that night we heard planes up there, but we could tell by the sound of the motor that they were the Grummans. Grummans, P-38s. And then we began to hear the drones. The Japanese zeros all had a drone to them. So we were, even though we were on the beach, we uh, stayed close to the foxhole. And uh, we watched, and we were watching these tracers going up. And we would see a plane go up, and then we'd see a plane get hit and come down and hit the ocean burning. It was a Japanese. And that was the night that Joe Foss and several of the other marine pilots became aces. And that was the first time in modern warfare that air, uh, night fighters were used in combat. And we were witness to that. Now, how long were you on Guadalcanal? Uh, we were on Guadalcanal. Uh, we, were, we were there for several months. And uh, the, we kept getting the air raids. And then we were told that we were going in on a landing. We were going to uh, Munda, New Georgia. And we were going to do the initial landing. And uh, we went in, and Munda was a, a terrible uh, battlefield. We lost a, a lot of men on Munda. And uh, our mission was to capture the Air Force. We went in on the island on one side and we were to go all the way across until the, we get the airfield, which we did. But we had times there where we were cut off and uh, our wounded was uh, unbelievable. In fact, at uh, one point I even ran out of medical supplies and went back to the aid station to get more supplies. Uh, you had we had people with bullet holes, shrapnel uh, from mortars, artillery. Uh, you could look inside of them, and you could push your fist inside of a, a wound. Now, uh, going back to the training that you had as a medic earlier, uh, sounds like that training didn't exactly prepare you for what you were dealing with. It, it didn't prepare us uh, because we didn't know what we were going to expect. What was it? But the one, the one thing that it did do is uh, when we were told that we were going into combat, 
everybody knows how they felt. What was it like? And uh, when I, when we were, we, the way they told us is, said effective immediately, there's no more shaving. Because the Japanese were afraid of bearded men, supposedly, supposedly. So I was really jumpy. You know, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I was an eternal optimist. I figured, well, they're not going to get me, but you're still concerned and you don't know what you're going to see about your buddies. And uh, But when we got into the com- actual combat, uh, I was the coolest person that you'd ever want to meet. Everything by the book, which was really the training. I know that I was told to do this in this situation or that situation, not to do this or that in that situation or this situation, and I did it. And when we, when it settled down and you were through, I would be jumpy again for a time being. And as a medic, were, were you, did you carry a weapon? I carried, uh, I carried a forty-five automatic and a carbine. Uh, for if you if you, you had you felt like secure with the gun, but I have to tell you that during combat, as a medic, you were going when the other guys were in the ground, you were going out of your foxhole above ground to go to someone that was wounded over here and somebody that was wounded over there, and you were treating the wounded, so you, you weren't uh, firing your gun, you were just moving. Because yeah, Japanese. right. But we did not have any identification. We did not wear red crosses. Our ambulances did not have red crosses on them. In Europe, they did, not in the Pacific, because the Japanese used everything uh, that they could. Uh, they would fight for that. And uh, we had uh, one of our chaplains and a medical officer were both blown up from a direct hit on a foxhole when they were in a foxhole together. Could you maybe tell us what your feelings, reactions were when you went to your first casualty as a medic? Uh, You know, there were so many at that point. I don't remember who the first one was on New Georgia. But you're, you're really thinking, I was, I was cool as a cucumber, number one. I looked for the bullet hole. And when I find the bullet hole, whether it was on a leg, an arm, a shoulder, or in the abdomen, wherever, uh, I immediately cut the back of, to, make, to see if the bullet went through or whether it was inside of him. And we poured uh, sulfonilamide in the wound from both sides and put uh, compresses on, put a tag on them uh, to send them back to the aid station. If they could walk, they would go back. If they uh, had to be littered, you would just let them lay there until somebody else would come up with a litter to carry them back. Uh, but we had a lot of wounded, and uh, it it just, it's like life became very cheap all of a sudden because you're laughing with somebody in the morning and they're buried at night or they're dead or they go back. How did you deal with that range of emotion like that? Uh, maybe religion came into it. Uh, the greatest guy, one of the greatest guys I ever met was our chaplain. Sorry. Father Evans. He would be on one side giving them last rites. I'd be on the other side patching them up knowing they're not going to make it but just giving them hope. And... Uh, the, uh, in the Jewish prayers, there's a Shema Yisrael. I said that more than a few times in the foxhole. Mm. And it's, um, it brings back memories that are not pleasant. 
But uh, you just go on and you do what you have to do. You really don't know what you can do until you have to. And you do it. And you do it. You try to do it the best you can. And in my mind, I know I did everything the best I could. And others did the same. When you're in combat, you're dependent on the man on your right and the man on your left. And the man on your right is dependent on the man on his left, and that's you. And the man on your left is dependent on the man on his right, and that's you. So you really are a team. And uh, it's all for one and everybody's together. And uh, when we finally finished uh, Munda, uh, New Georgia, I thought we'd never go into combat again. And I had an opportunity to get out of the infantry. They were looking for people that could do typing and stuff to go back to division. And let me tell you, if you were back in division, you might as well have been in New York City. Uh, You were that far removed from that front line. That front line was treacherous because you just didn't know what's going to happen. And uh, I figured, well, I'm never going into combat again. And I've gone this far with these men. I'm staying with them. And I had that opportunity twice and twice I turned it down. And uh, then we we went back to Guadalcanal for some reason just to regroup. And then we uh, went to Bougainville. And we were on the initial landing in Bougainville. And on Bougainville, it was a huge island. Uh, and all we had was a perimeter. Uh, if the island is this big, we had this deal here for just the air base and what we needed. And uh, we sent patrols out uh, every day. And uh, the mission was to get hit. Now, what do you mean, get hit? You were to go... As you were to keep going until you till you reach some Japanese. And to get hit means that they saw you and they fired at you. And we were to, the mission was to get hit and pull back. Because all they wanted to do is know where they were. Just know where they were. And we went out on uh, one patrol. Uh, we were going out and we had some Marines with us on this day. Two Marines and two big, beautiful Dobermans. And uh, I mentioned to the Marine, I said, what happens if the wind goes the wrong way? He said, there'll be two dead Dobermans and two dead Marines. And that night there was. The wind came the wrong way. And we were in an ambush. And uh, our lead sergeant stepped on a landmine. He had a hole in him as big as your fist. I tried to patch him up. He wanted to, he was crying for his wife. He wanted his wife. (laughs) And those things are tough to listen to. You can't do anything for him. And finally, we called for artillery. And our own artillery was landing right in front of us. But we finally got out. And that was a Christmas day. And that night, we were listening to the news. We were back at camp. And we were, they had radios that they had on trees on Atwater Kent, I think it was. They hook it up on a tree. And we were listening to the news from the United States. And they said in the Pacific, everything was quiet. It was limited to patrol duty. Patrol activity is all that took place. But I knew I was on that patrol that wasn't so quiet. And uh, and that's the way it was. And uh, then the Japanese tried to take the island back. And they had a massive... A massive push. 
and uh, we were called up and we were we were on Hill 500 there were no cities everything was numbered we were on Hill 500 700 I don't remember now but the second battalion they got the brunt of it and uh, the uh, one of my buddies uh, Petraka, the company aid man for one of the companies in the second battalion, he was killed. He, he did get the Congressional Medal of Honor. And um, then on our side, when I went up, and we had to go. The trail was there was an opening there to get up to the line to get in the foxhole, and we were taking our holding our spaces in there. And uh, I remember I went up and I made it. And uh, right behind me, just as I got past the opening, I heard this crack of a bullet. And I turned around and one of my buddies spun around and fell down. Uh, so I immediately went back. The, he, the sniper could have lined up on me. I don't know. But I made it back, and I start working on him. He, this is uh, Pat Malloy, a de very devout Catholic. I'm Jewish. And uh, as I was working on him, he, he had a bullet hole right through the chest. And uh, he was laying there stiff as a board. His arms were up and his legs were up. But I rolled him over to see if the bullet went all the way through, and it did. There was no blood. And a fellow came over to help me, Jose Gallis, an Italian. I'll tell you that for a reason. So we're working on him. I patch him up, and uh, we can't get a sound out of him. And we, we decided that he was dead. So Josie and Gallus went back to his platoon and uh, I was putting his bayonet on his rifle to put it in the ground for the uh, people to pick him up for burial. And just as I was got up and I looked down at him, he made the sign of the crucifix on himself. So I called Zingales back and I said, you know, Pat's still alive. He said, no, I don't think so. I said, he just made the sign of the crucifix on himself. And I said, if we leave him here, they'll bury him alive. And the aid station was about 100 yards. So I said, why don't we carry him back to the aid station and uh, get him some help so he gets back to a hospital. So we carry him back. And there's about a, excuse me, there's about a five foot drop. And I'm holding on, I didn't know my strength, I'm holding on to this, I'm holding him like this, hanging down there, and I don't know how I held him, and I'm hanging on to this little tree. And the tree gave way, because it was raining and it was muddy, and uh, heavy rain and mortars were dropping. And I fell on top of this guy who's half dead. And Joe Zingales was down there. We pick him up. We take him to the aid station. And the medical officer looked at him and said, over there with the dead ones. I said, Captain, he's not dead. And I tell him he made the sign of the crucifix on himself. Here's the Jewish guy talking about the crucifix over and over again. And... Uh, he said, he, they called me Doc Savage because of the medic. I was a medic, number one in the magazine, Doc Savage. And he said, Doc, I know he's a friend of yours over there. So I said to Joe, I said, you know, Joe, I've got the tags. Why am I asking him? So I, the medical tags. So I put on there the bullet wound he had and tagged him up. And there was a half track going about. And we put him on a half track, and he left. We saw the half track going. We went back up 
We went back up on the line. And all of this, you know, it sounds like it's forever, but it's only a matter of minutes. You know, we could have been gone five minutes, ten minutes, that's all. And uh, about three, four months later, I get a letter from my mother. She got a letter from somebody she doesn't know, from Pat Malloy. So he's telling her how we saved his life, that he could hear everything we were saying, but that he could not answer us, but he heard us. So uh, when the war ended and I got married in 1948 on my honeymoon, we were going to New York, so I said we were going through Philadelphia, and I went to see him. And he took me upstairs and he showed me where they had removed a couple of his ribs. And he was hit by the sniper, so the, uh, the heat of the bullet from close range cauterized the wound, was why there was no blood. The impact of the bullet sort of moved his lung and his heart this way. And uh, so he lived and he wound up marrying his nurse who had all of his medical records. And before I left him, I told him, I said, you know, Pat, there's two things I want to tell you. Number one, you should go to Mass every Sunday and a few times in between the week. And I said, number two, forget the name Doc Savage. And he used to call me an Irish carpenter, which I didn't know what it was until he told me it was a Jewish fellow because Jesus was a carpenter and was Jewish. And I said... Um, Forget the name Sid Savage, forget the Irish Carpenter, forget the name Josie Gallis. But if anybody asks you why you're walking the face of the earth, you tell them it's because of a Jew and an Italian. Because he was a little bit of a bigot. A great guy, wonderful guy, but a little bit of a bigot. And uh, he lived for about 15 or 20 years after that. And he had a bench job. And he, uh, so... Even though he didn't have a long life, he he at least enjoyed some of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Did you ever have occasion uh, on Bougainville or any of the other islands to uh, treat Japanese uh, soldiers or prisoners wounds? Uh, I never treated a Japanese. Uh, I, I never got close enough to a Japanese to even. I saw them dead. I didn't see them alive. And uh, I don't know if it was a military secret at the time. We did not take Japanese prisoners. Uh, In our outfit, every now and then they would, somebody would capture a couple and they would take him in to interrogate him. After they were interrogated, the officer, and we had two fellows who uh, maybe I shouldn't name. That was sort of their hobby. And he would say, take him out and let him escape. And uh, they'd go out and a couple minutes later you'd hear a couple cracks of a rifle and the two guys would come back in. And they'd say, well, we took him out, but they, they tried to escape. They killed him. So we never took any. And even though uh, it's interesting to note that we always made sure that we took our own wounded and killed back for burial, if they were dead, to see that they had proper burial. Whereas the Japanese, in this particular battle of Bougainville, it was so bad that there were just thousands of Japanese laying in front of the hill. So all they did was they took a bulldozer and they just bulldozed a big hole and just common burial. And those were some mother's child also. But they were just bulldozed. And I, I think the only prisoners might have been taken were at the end of the war when they surrendered in mass, when they came walking in. But not during combat. At least we never took, we never took any uh, prisoners. Now you mentioned also while you were on Loganville, you had the other extreme because you got to go to a to a USO show. Yeah, on Bougainville we we had uh, we didn't get we didn't have many many uh, 
USO shows because it was too dangerous for the entertainers. But we did have, uh, we had uh, uh, Bob Hope. We saw Bob Hope. He came over there. We saw Jack Benny. And uh, they were the two big ones. And uh, on Guadalcanal, we had the little Jackie Heller. Jackie Heller was a singer with Ben Burney in his orchestra. And I remember he was putting on a show. This is why we were on the beach at Guadalcanal. We were at Henderson Airfield. And in the middle of his show, we had an air raid. And it was kind of uh, interesting. And when the air raid was over, uh, he c- continued his show. And our planes were coming in, limping in, with the wings half blown off and all. It was a real touching thing. I remember that. And uh, I got to meet him. Uh, we At one point, we were in a foxhole for a few minutes. And he said, he's going to open up a nightclub in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I said, well, I'm from uh, Akron, Ohio. He said, well, if you ever get to Pittsburgh, be sure to come to my nightclub. And I did. I went to see him. Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, the night, the night that we were there, the main attraction was... Uh, What's the guy that used to do the the family? Uh, oh, real popular, the big heavy set guy. Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason was the headliner that night, and he couldn't even hold the crowd. But after that, he became a, a star. I have no regret whatsoever. In fact, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Well, when you were discharged and came home from the service... When did you feel like you were home? Uh, I was just, when I came home, we landed in San Francisco. They took us to Pittsburgh, California, where we got a meal. We were fed by the German prisoners. And then we went to Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And that's where I was discharged. When I came home, it really felt good to be home. My mother did not recognize me at the station. I had just come out of the hospital having been treated for amoebic dysentery and I was down to about 118 pounds and my skin was real yellow from uh, taking Atabrin. But uh, it was good to be home and every time I heard an airplane I'd stop in my tracks to listen to the sound of the motor even though I was in Akron, Ohio and I knew they couldn't be over here. It was good to be home. I couldn't sleep on a bed My mother would cry. She'd come in in the morning. I'd be sleeping on the floor because the bed was too soft for me. I slept on the ground for years. I was overseas three and a half years. I was in for almost five. I said, I think we're about done here with the tape. I just wanted to tell you one thing. uh, You've you've probably heard of the Jewish boys having their bar bar mitzvahs and stuff. When they're 13, they become a, a man, so to speak. And uh, you have your prayer shawl and the deal they wrap around their arm, put on their head. You've seen pictures of it. And my mother insisted I take those to the service with me, which I did. And uh, you have, when you go into combat, you have an A bag and a B bag. The A bag is what you absolutely need, just your bare essentials. And your B bag is whatever you don't need will follow you up, come catch up with you. Well, I don't remember which island we were going into, but the B bags never caught up with us because the the ship was sunk that had the B bags on them. And when I got home and I was unpacking my stuff, and on one of the holidays, my mother said, where's your uh, prayer shawl? And uh, deal. I, she said, you took it to the army with you, didn't you? And I said, yeah, I took it. I said, but I, I didn't bring it back. So I explained to her that it went down with the ship. And like a typical Jewish mother, she said, you see, the prayer shawl went instead of you. 
So I looked her in the eye, and I said, you know, yeah, Mom, but how about the boys that went with the ship? And uh, on that subject, Ernie Schaffrick, who was German, our mess sergeant, he went home on, a, on his last weekend home. And his mother said, Ernie, if you have to go to Europe, you could kill your, one of your uncles or your cousins or whatever. You're going to fight if you fight the Germans. So try to shoot over their heads. And he said, yeah, Mom, but how do I know they're going to try to shoot over my head? I never forgot that. War is not like the movies. It's hell. And you, you can't talk about it. You really have to live it. I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience. And if you offered me a million dollars to go through it again and guarantee I'd be back, I wouldn't take it. That's the war. But I did what I could for everyone I could. And I'm sure, as you have related, there's a lot of fellows who are here because of what you've done. I hope so. I hope so. Well, Sid, we certainly appreciate you taking time here to tell your story. And we certainly appreciate your service and your duty to country. And uh, we just thank you for being part of this project. Thank you. With all its faults, it's the best country in the world. Amen. With all its faults, it's the best. Old Glory looks pretty good in a foreign port. You look at that American flag in a foreign port, it takes on a different look. Yes. 